all of that kind of what what feels to me often like maintenance is actually so central like don't skimp on it don't feel like you're you're not quote doing the work like maybe it's not words on a page but it's really essential to allowing you to put the words on a page Welcome to Drafting the Past, a podcast about the craft of writing history. I'm your host, Kate Carpenter, and in this episode, I talk to a historian whose work and writing I have long admired, Bathsheba DeMuth. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Dr. DeMuth is the author of the award-winning book, Floating Coast, An Environmental History of the Bering Strait, as well as essays published in many places, including the Washington Post, The Atlantic, Orion Magazine, The New Yorker, and others. Her work has also been featured in the Best American Science and Nature Writing and Best American Travel Writing anthologies. Dr. DeMuth is an assistant professor of history and environment and society at Brown University. In a lot of ways, I went to graduate school in history because I was interested in writing. I was also interested in questions that I felt like could be addressed either by history as a discipline and the training that you get in the discipline or by anthropology. I was really split when I was applying to grad school. And what really settled me on history actually is the flexibility of how you write history. It's not a discipline that requires a particular kind of genre. Um, I think historians do everything from biography to, you know, broad ocean spanning work. And it's also one where the necessity to write in a certain kind of academic voice seems to vary a great deal. So I kind of had that in mind when I went to grad school. Um, I picked my program in part because my advisor at UC Berkeley, Yuri Sloskin, very much cares about writing and and spoke about it when we were uh, talking before I accepted grad schools. But I also had no idea how to to do it in a professional sense, right? And a history PhD program <laughs> trains you to do many things, but it doesn't talk about the kind of writing side of the profession as being part of your professional life in some really key ways. It talks about, you know, going to archives and assembling arguments and and writing essays. But particularly when it came to public facing writing, I sort of stumbled into that about three years ago, two and a half years ago. I'm pretty new to it in a lot of ways and feel that I'm mostly figuring it out as I go <laughs> um, because it's not a part of my my formal training. So I already knew that Dr. DeMuth wrote her dissertation with an eye toward publishing with the trade press. Before this interview, I searched out her dissertation online so I could get a sense of how it had changed before publication, and I was surprised to find that it wasn't as different as I had expected. I asked Dr. DeMuth how she made time and space for writing such engaging narrative prose during grad school, and what motivated her to do so. So I think there were a couple of things at play when I sat down and started trying to figure out how to write a dissertation, uh, which I really thought of as the first draft of a book. Um, It's something that my advisor emphasized. um, And I I know there's really conflicting advice on that front. Some people want them to be very separate projects. I really thought of this as like the first draft of a book length project. So I think I did have that in mind to begin with. And I did want it to reach as many people as I as I could. And some of that was sort of because of my own sense of obligation toward the story that I was telling and toward the place. And some of that was actually a very practical matter. Because Floating Coast sits literally on top of two different national historiographies, I had people on my committee who were trained as Russian historians and people on my committee trained as, envir- or not environmental, but as American historians. And they don't necessarily have a common set of ideas and books and things shared, right? So Mm -hmm. if I'm going to write about the Russian Revolution for my Americanist readers, I have to explain it in ways that are relatively straightforward and interesting, and will keep them engaged. And the same thing if I'm talking about the New Deal for the Russianist on my committee. And none of the people at Berkeley on my committee were environmental historians. So (laughs) none of them came to this project being like, yes, I want to work with the woman who's talking about whales, right? (laughs) I was kind of foisting that on them in some ways. And I was also aware because I had been told pretty explicitly early on that the geography of this dissertation put it outside what many people would find interesting. I was actually told that straight up by Richard White, who's one of the kind of founders of environmental history as a field, who basically told me to to get out while I could. And in many ways, it was one of the best pieces of advice I ever have received, although I completely ignored it, because what I realized was I had to make this part of the world compelling to an audience of people who do not get up in the morning thinking about the Bering Strait. And that to me is a writing issue, right? It's how do you how do you make the place alive for people? How do you draw them in? And that's the only way to get them to the argument. 
And in fact, as I was doing it, I realized that is the argument, that the two things are not actually separable in any real sense. I think that that's, that's why the dissertation came to look how it looked. And I was also writing it at Berkeley, which was a program that at the time gave grad students quite a bit of, of time. I knew that I had you know, seven or eight years to get through the program, which is very different than what a lot of history graduate students have now, which tends to be five to six. And that was really important. It, it took me two years to write the dissertation, writing it, you know, basically every day. And that is not always the conditions in which people have the time to write. <laughs> were there people you were looking to as inspiration as you worked on your craft or classes you took? Yes, I ended up reading a lot of people working in kind of long form nonfiction who were not academics. And I think in this book, Barry Lopez's work was particularly kind of my my lodestar and useful for thinking, especially less about conveying the historical parts of the narrative, because he writes less about history, but more in the, the capacity to sort of summon a place and to talk about the kind of more technical scientific concepts that emerge in parts of this book in ways that are faithful to what's happening, <laughs> but also interesting and, and intelligible for a non-specialist audience. I also read Moby Dick frequently just because I really like the language. I wouldn't even read it like from back to front. I just sort of pick it up because it has all these short chapters and just sort of look at the way that Melville, you know, uses verbs and kind of drops people into scenes that they're not familiar with and is you know, fills them with pathos and humor and kind of human content, even when they are are not things that you've necessarily experienced directly in your life. And, and I think just in general, I, by the time I was writing the dissertation, there was like the pile of books and materials that I needed in order to write a chapter. But in order to kind of think about the structure of the project itself, I was mostly reading kind of non-historians and trying to reverse engineer how do you make the structure part of the the kind of big takeaway? How do you make paragraphs fit into a section? How many ideas can you put in a paragraph? <laughs> how do you introduce characters and how much do you need to know about them? Just kind of that technical stuff that I mostly learned from looking at other people's writing and, and figuring out what made it alive to me and hoping that I could figure out a version of it for myself. When and where do you do your writing? I usually work in my office where I am now, um, and I had a little office in grad school also, which just sort of progressively is uh, the sort of archaeological layers of books and papers accrete as I am working on something, and then I will finish a section or a essay, and then I put them all away, and then that process kind of repeats itself, but at least I can close the door and keep it out of everyone's life the rest of the time. And I am an incredibly routinized person. I get up in the morning and I go for a run, which is where 90% of the actual thinking about writing happens, even if I don't know that's what's going on in my head. Sometimes I do and I have to stop and like frantically take notes on my phone. And then I come home and get cleaned up and have breakfast. And usually my best writing is in the morning. So, you know, I, I try to kind of protect the the pre 1pm hours, but I can often if I'm sort of in a, in a groove, keep going after that. So yeah, that's kind of the, the routine. And I can do that day after day. It's extraordinarily dull. <laughs> <laughs> How do you organize your research as you're going? I mean, you not only do a tremendous amount of research, but you also have a wide variety of approaches to research. How do you keep track? This is a really good question because I think that um, we have all kind of stumbled into being digital historians, particularly in the COVID age, when even sources that we might have seen in a more corporeal form are now coming to us in PDFs. And I have a, a really kind of tripartite a division of organizational labor that makes no sense, I don't think, to anyone but me, um, <laughs> but does allow me to go find particularly the the kind of digitized sources I'm working with quickly. The books, I just sort of rely on muscle memory to find them in whichever pile. <laughs> I have left them open in with their spines open. I mean, every librarian would just despair at my book treatment. But in terms of digital sources, I use Zotero for things that are published in some form because it's so good at pulling the bibliographic information from the internet. It's really good at kind of assembling collections of books that I need to read. For archival sources or even published primary sources, I use a, a program called MaxQDA that I started using in grad school. That's a database that allows you to read and take notes on and flag and tag PDFs and Word documents and other kinds of 
audio files, text files, video. I found that particularly useful when I was kind of in the writing phase and that I could be working with a variety of sources and, you know, realize that, you know, here are four things that belong in chapter three, but I'm working on chapter one. And you can sort of start putting them, tagging them to like, you know, reindeer migration or climate you know, various things that you know are coming up down the road. And then when you start writing that chapter, you have all these breadcrumbs you've left yourself. And it was extraordinarily useful when I was revising because, Mm. you know, it was a couple of years out. I didn't remember in which file, which year, which archive sometimes I had found this tidbit, but I needed to go back and look at the full source again. And having that database really made that possible. Um, So anytime I have the discipline to go through and really code what it is that I'm working on thoroughly, I have never regretted it. (laughs) Future (laughs) self is always happy for past self having done that work, even if it's not the most interesting in the moment. And when I'm in archives, I use just a a very basic spreadsheet to be like, here's the box I'm looking at, here's what it's in, here are the dates it uses, so that I have that kind of metadata that's outside of the database that I can search really quickly. It's a mess is actually the, (laughs) or it's chaos, but I I sort of know the route through. Are you a person who likes to have basically all the research done before you start writing, or do you take more of an iterative approach? So this is a question that I feel I am trying to transition out of one mode and into the other. So with the first book, which came out of my dissertation, I had this huge luxury of A, doing the research before COVID, and B, doing it in grad school when I was not teaching. So I spent a year going to archives in the US. I spent a year going to archives in Russia. And then after assembling all of that and taking lots of notes, I turned up in Berkeley to write for two years and finish it. This is not how writing the second book when you (laughs) actually have a teaching job looks like, for one thing. And for another, I haven't been able to do most of that archival work over the last two years, which is sort of right when I would have been starting it on the second project for obvious reasons. The archives have been closed. Travel has not been easy. So I'm trying to kind of feel my way into the methodology of writing with what you have and then thinking about where the the big questions remain, where are the kinds of sources that I feel are lacking and really preventing me from pushing what I want to say in in a direction. But I am a little worried about it because I feel like there was something with the first book where I just kind of lived in tremendous confusion (laughs) for (laughs) about 18 months in those first 18 months of archival research, where every day I got up and I had no idea what this was going to become, right? It was just a big tangle. There was lots of interesting things popping out of the archives, but I, I didn't have a chapter outline. I didn't even have a sense beyond working on both sides of the Bering Strait where it was going. And then it kind of all clicked into place. And I think it was because I had the capacity to just sort of swim around in the sources for a long time and not be worried about producing something that was coherent for anyone else, because it was definitely not coherent for me. And I think that imposing that order too early runs the risk of missing things, because then you're sort of locked into the, the narrative structure, you're you know, have some attachment to the arguments you've started to make. And maybe they aren't, you know, valid, or they don't stand up, or they're more complicated, or, you know, you saw one tiny slice of things. So I'm having a really difficult time with the iterative approach in in this, uh, (laughs) even though it is what we have at the moment. What does the revision process look like for you? This is a really good question. And I feel like it's one that I did not talk about in grad school at all. It's like the, the kind of, once you have a draft, what do you do with it? What I did was the the first year after I finished, I basically didn't look at my dissertation. I sort of put it away. I drafted an article that was based on a chapter of it, but that became enough of its own thing. It didn't feel like I was directly in contact with my own writing all the time. And then on a very horrifying day, after about a year, I went and printed out the whole dissertation and read it, which... I don't know about you, but I find rereading my old words to not be my favorite activity. So I had to be like, all right, just sort of muscle through this um, and start to think uh, particularly about how to take the five big chapters of the dissertation and split them into kind of a more sensible chapter structure for readers that does not involve 30,000 words at once. Where to shorten things? Where did I repeat myself? I had by that point a long list of uh, sources that I had found while I was working on chapters as I went that needed to, you know, stuff that I found working on chapter five that needed to go in chapter one. So I knew I needed to do that work. But a lot of it was kind of thinking structurally initially, 
Um, and then I just rewrote it front to back in one draft, sent that draft out for, for peer review and for my manuscript workshop, rewrote it again front to back based on that, um, sent it to my editor, got her notes back, did that a third time, um, and that was kind of the final version. But the thing I discovered is that each of those redrafting things takes less and less time. So the first redrafting took me most of a year. The second one after peer review took me three months. The one after with my editor's comments took me three weeks. Um, so you're not signing yourself up for really rewriting your dissertation every time. And the fourth draft is magical because you know what you want to say. You've said most of it. Um, and you're actually at the place of kind of working at the sentence level and the paragraph level to make sure that it actually gets there. So it, it also becomes, to me, a substantively different uh, kind of intellectual activity between the first draft, which I think, honestly, whenever I write something the first time, I'm writing it for myself only just to try to figure out what's going on. And then I have to go through it again and say, okay, if you are not me, what do you need to know when? Um, how can I bring you into this story? What is it that would be a metaphor that guides us through those kinds of things? That's not necessarily there right off the bat. From a previous conversation, I already knew that Dr. DeMuth had gotten her agent as she was finishing graduate school. This is pretty uncommon, so I asked her to tell me how that had happened. So I ended up with an agent because I was a finalist for a job at Vanderbilt. So I showed up uh, in Nashville, Tennessee at the airport, and the chair of the hiring committee, uh, Helmut Smith, who's a German historian, picked me up very kindly from the airport. And the first thing that he said to me was, you should not publish your dissertation with an academic press. You should definitely publish it with a trade press. And I was like, is this part of the job interview? Is this a, like, <laughs> what are we, what's happening? Um, and at the same time, you know, this, this is a thing that had been on my mind since I started grad school. You know, if the clouds part and the angels sing kind of scenario. But Helmut very kindly put me in contact with the agent that I work with now. And I I spent the kind of summer right as I was finishing my dissertation and starting at Brown, uh, writing my book proposal for, for trade presses. We've talked a lot about your process for books, but you also write beautifully in essay form. Does that process look different for you? Yes. So I have realized over the last two years that I really, I really love the essay form and the, the essays that are in the, you know, three to 4,500, 3,000 to 4,500 word range, which doesn't really exist in academic writing, right? We Historians basically write kind of big journal article length things that are eight to 14,000 words and books and book chapters. But there's this other genre that exists for a kind of different audience that can be there. I mean, they're, they're fact checked, they're based in things that happened. I use the same source base that I use for historical writing, but they're driven by questions that are framed very differently than historical ones. Mm -hmm. And part of why I like writing them is that they are a place to think about some of the questions that really preoccupy me as a historian, the ways that we're supposed to relate to the places that we live, the, the, the nature of economic systems and how they are enmeshed with our lives and constrained, but also liberate our choices, what it is that the environment kind of speaks back to us all the time, and narrate them in ways that are not formulated around an argument in the explicit way that academic work tends to require. I find that there sometimes can be much more playful. They are scene-based. They require that you just really pull people into a conversation and a, a series of thoughts with you, um, not telling them what to think, but telling them how you came to think something or see something in a particular way. And I really enjoy that. It feels more conversational, I think. And there's something a little bit adversarial about a lot of academic writing to me. Like we're, mm -hmm. we're always have kind of our fists up just in case somebody's coming for us. Okay. And I think essays are a very different form in that sense that they're kind of trying to invite people into, into a world with you. So in all of your writing, both in the book and in the essays, place plays such a major role. And of course, that, that's true for many environmental historians, but for you, place really comes alive. How do you do that? I mean, I'm glad that it works first, because you never know as a writer, right? It's You sure. send these things off into the world with crossed fingers and closed eyes, just sort of hoping. I think one thing I do frequently when writing is I go back to the notes that I've taken in the places that I've been that are either similar or the same to where I'm writing about. And I take a lot of photographs when I'm working up north. So 
that helps me kind of bring back what did it look like. And usually the visuals kind of come with a sense of the other kind of sensory world that's associated with it. And then I try to think about what is it that if you haven't been to a beach on the Russian side of the Bering Strait, for example, what is it that's surprising if you've not been there before? What are the things that would be helpful for a reader to know about what this place looks like or smells like or you know, what direction the wind is coming from and include those things. Because I think just at a sort of sentence level, it helps you get away from kind of cliches and be really specific. And I think then hopefully for readers, it kind of gives you a a visual or a sensory relationship with the place as much as you can have through a piece of writing. And I have found that helpful, not just when talking about kind of direct experience, but in approaching sources that our historical sources are often so full of people remarking on details that are so striking about the worlds that they're in that, you know, it was so cold this one winter that the stones in our hearth inside the cabin cracked, or they just kind of bubble up all the time. And I started to realize that those details give some ability to kind of project that sensory experience into past spaces that I, of course, can't ever enter and, and none of us can directly, but to to give them a little bit more lived in kind of corporeal feeling, which I think for environmental writing is important, um, partly because sometimes we're describing past states that don't exist anymore, like kinds of cold that don't exist anymore. And in some cases, because it just makes it feel less, less like a a thing that has kind of stopped having any influence over human lives, right? If you can actually show the ways that these these places exist and are felt and participate in making people experience their days. To talk more concretely about how she approaches writing, I asked Dr. DeMuth to talk me through the opening paragraphs of an essay that she recently wrote for Granta. The essay is called On Mistaking Whales. I'll link to it in the show notes, and you really should go read the whole thing. It's beautiful. But here's the opening of that essay. Before a gray whale becomes a home, or a barrel of oil, or a metaphor, before she enters the realm of human meaning, she is a being complete in herself. Born as most gray whales are on an early January day off northwestern Mexico's Baja Peninsula, her mother swims upside down, tail lifted, straining up, up, and she emerges headfirst, not into water, but into the air. 2,000 pounds of smooth pewter muscle born facing the sky. For the next three months, she practices pacing her breaths, the rise to the surface that keeps her from drowning in the water that is her home. In the calm lagoons, she grows more than a ton each month. In April, the gray whale and her mother began traveling north. They are often inside of land, desert scrub becoming grassland, grassland turning to redwood groves and temperate rainforest as they move up the long arc of the North American continent. Their nearshore waters are punctuated by din, the ports of Los Angeles, Oakland, Seattle, and Vancouver, each calling in its braided lanes of shipping traffic. In June, as they reach Unimog Pass in the Aleutian Islands, there is less clamor. They have swum more than 4,000 miles, not for quiet, but for the Bering Sea's pasture of clams and tube worms below them in the muck, creatures that have rounded generations of the whale's kin in blubber. As mother and calf scoop up the benthic riches, muddy blooms rise and trace across the sea's surface. It's important to note that that first sentence probably took me the better part of a week to write. And it wasn't that I, I was writing other parts of the essay during that week, this wasn't the only thing on my, you know, Word document. But it took me that long because I am a terrible outliner of essay. I don't necessarily start them knowing where they're going to go. I tend to start an essay like this knowing that there's a place in mind. This one was commissioned. It was for a issue of the journal that talks about travel writing. So I knew that I was working within and, or at least you know, kind of in conversation with this genre of travel writing and why it should exist and should it exist. So I had those questions in mind because of the commission for the essay. And I had talked with the editor about where it would be placed. So I knew I was writing about this trip to Chukotka. And I had sort of settled on writing about gray whales because I had a lot of material about them that didn't end up in the book. And there had been kind of a lot of discussion about gray whales in the last couple of years since the book came out. But that's all pretty 
general. <laughs> like that's not a structure. It's not a point. It's not a, um, how do I get from here to there? So I can spend a really long time writing these opening segments of an essay because what I'm really doing is trying to figure out what the darn thing is about. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I realized that the kind of, since it was a piece of travel writing, the journey that I wanted to take readers on was you know, about being in this place in Chukotka, but it was about also thinking about whales as beings that you can go to see, but they also have these kind of independent lives. And so that's where you get the the first sentence from. It actually kind of maps out where the whole essay is going, walks you through the different ways people have known whales, but then turns to thinking about the whale herself and what a gray whale is in the world. And that just comes from sort of what we know of them and a what people have observed of them. And, and, you know, the opening paragraph also let me do some work that's just kind of important for any essay, which is telling you where in the world you're going to be and how you're getting there. So, you know, we kind of follow the whale to the North Pacific, follow her, see why she goes to the North Pacific, be, you know, because it's in sort of important for her as a, as a being. And that's, th that's something that I have learned about this kind of uh, non-academic writing is there are certain things you need to be able to tell readers pretty early on so that they can orient themselves. And finding an entry point into an essay that allows that to happen is important. So that's the kind of slow way. <laughs> I, basically, I was constantly revising the same sentence over and over again, and then writing just a lot about whale behavior and then kind of paring it down into this. How do you bring writing into the classroom now that you're also a professor? That's a really good question, because I think that of the things that I find give students at all levels, like from first year to finishing grad student stress, it's writing things, which I understand because, you know, it's the it's the best worst thing or the worst best thing. You know, it, I love to do it. And then in the middle of any project, I sincerely wonder why it is that I ever said yes or <laughs> signed myself up for it. And it's really personal too. And so there's this terrible moment in the piece of any, or in the life of any piece of writing where you have to hand it over to other people. So I understand why there is lots of stress. And so I've started to think that part of my role as somebody who talks about writing and has writing as part of my coursework is to, first of all, be frank about that, right? To not pathologize it, not say it's abnormal to feel exposed when you hand in a piece of writing, or it's it's okay to it's okay to not have your first draft be perfect. I think that that's something that students I work with at all levels still really struggle with. And so I've started actually bringing into class what a well-edited first page of an essay looks like from editors that I've worked with. Like, this is something that's going to be published. And it comes back to me with lots of notes on it. And that's normal. That's how it should be. It's collaborative. It's okay to get feedback. That's the only way that we make our writing not just better, but bring it up to the thing that we actually had in mind. We cannot do that alone. So try to demystify some of that process. And then also talk really explicitly about what good feedback looks like. Because I think another, you can either like not want any and sort of like keep the feedback away from me or feel sort of obliged to take in everything anyone has ever said <laughs> and try to somehow harmonize it in what you're doing, which is impossible um, at some level. So learning to kind of identify what kinds of writing interventions are really helpful when it is that you can kind of see, or you just disagree, right? And in any kind of editor edity relationship I've been in, there's been places where I've been like, no, I really don't want to change that. It's important. It's said that way. Even at, at the level of copy editing, being like, I know that that's grammatically the correct way to say that, but I'm not going to call the animal a what. I'm going to call it a who, and I'm not going to negotiate on it. And so, you know, I think thinking of it as a give and take rather than a thing where you just sort of have to absorb everyone's criticism. Sometimes people are wrong and sometimes they're transformatively correct. So talking about that. Do you have a writing community that you're a part of? This is a place where I have gotten unbelievably lucky and it's, I don't know what fluke of geography has produced this, but Providence and the kind of greater Providence area has a, a really unusual density of people, particularly people writing about the environment. So Elizabeth Rush, who wrote the book Rising, um, is my neighbor. She's like five houses over from me. Rebecca Altman, who writes these beautiful 
works on plastics and is working on what is going to be an absolute field transforming book on plastic. She lives half a mile away from me. We go walking every Saturday morning. Carrie Arsenal, who wrote the book Milltown, she's a little further away. Like she has to kind of get in a car, um, but it's close (laughs) enough that I see her fairly regularly and talk to her quite often. Um, And so there's this kind of core group and there there are other folks who are kind of associated with this and it's a, a loose and kind of always evolving group of people. But those are the core folks that I maybe not daily, but pretty close to daily, have conversations with about what it is that we're writing or how terrible it was that we chose to write about this or look at this amazing thing we found. And that has been, it's been really transformative, I think, because none of those women are writing in a specifically academic mode. So it's a very different writing community than I have access to through the kind of formal workshops and things like that that are extremely generative and helpful, but are also not the folks that I'm texting to be like, I am stuck in paragraph five, and I'm never going to get out. (laughs) Um, Outside of your own community, are there historians or maybe nonfiction writers more broadly that you really look to as people writing in a way you admire now? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's a long list and one that I feel like every time I I rattle something off, I forget somebody who um, I really care about. I think that the work Rob McFarlane is doing is really has taken the kind of quote unquote nature writing genre and and kind of pulled it in directions that the 21st century really requires and needs. So he's someone whose writing I always look forward to. Uh, Jessica J. Lee, her book, Two Trees Make a Forest, I think is another place where you see the kind of intermeshing of uh, historical tools that come out of the academy, kind of mixed with memoir, producing something that's kind of its own new genre. It's similar to Carrie Arsenault's Milltown to me in that way, that it is really working between genres, doing interesting things with nonfiction. You can see that it's like so carefully researched and and thought about at the kind of empirical level, but is kind of married to a narrative structure that that pushes it in a, in a lot of other directions. Those two folks come right to mind. I really, it's not an, I don't know, I never know where to ca- categorize poetry in the world of fiction or nonfiction. I feel like it just transcends those two categories completely. But Joan Neviah Kane, who's a Nupiak poet, her work is something that I keep close kind of at all times. Um, I think it's really It has kind of a transformative way of using language and moving between English and Anupiak in her in her latest work and thinking about place linguistically in ways that are really um, beautiful and and challenging. Right. And partly that's challenging just because I'm not trained to read poetry. So I always feel like I come to it as a real rube, um, but (laughs) but love it anyway. I don't know. There's there are so many. I feel like particularly in the world of environmental writing that there's this been kind of recent very recent, in fact, kind of turned to thinking about it as a political form, I think in large part because of the climate crisis, kind of yanking it out of the, what Kathleen Jamie calls the uh, lone and raptured male (laughs) mode (laughs) of writing and into something that's thinking about community creation and power and, you know, those things that are really kind of bread and butter questions for historians, but, but putting them together with narrative forms that bring us into the present and can be accessible to different kinds of communities. If you could go back and give writing advice to your graduate school self, what would you what would you advise her? I think one of the things on just a practical level is the the activities that feel like they are auxiliary to writing, the reading of things, taking notes on them, putting them in your database in a way that makes sense, not leaving 45 tabs open on your browser, assuming that you're going to remember why they were important to you in six weeks when your browser crashes. All of that kind of what what feels to me often like maintenance is actually so central. Like don't skimp on it. Don't feel like you're you're not, quote, doing the work. Like maybe it's not words on a page. It's really essential to allowing you to put the words on a page and not feel like you have lost something or, and I think on the losing something front, just never assume you'll remember it. Like if you have an idea or a scrap of a thought or suddenly remember something that you read and exactly where it is, just write it down, like have a system for leaving yourself really generous notes about what you've been thinking. And sometimes you'll go back to them and be like, that is hilarious. Like, <laughs> What was I, what on earth was I thinking? And sometimes you're like, that's what I've been trying to say for the last, you know, three weeks. And I actually just crystallized it on a run four months ago. 
and left myself a note about it. And I, I often, I think I have a kind of desire to, to always be writing and therefore sometimes give short shrift to some of those other things, which are just as important. Can I ask what you're working on these days? Yes. <laughs> um, I feel like this needs giant, you know, 20, 20 sized asterisks around it still. I'm working on a history of the Yukon River watershed, um, which is the big river that starts in what is now Canada and goes through Alaska to the Bering Sea. And I was in the kind of preliminary month of research on this project up in Alaska in March of 2020. So decamped from Alaska kind of as COVID was working its way across the country and therefore haven't done a lot of the archival work on it. But what I'm interested in in this part of the world is the way in which different human communities have generated different ways of bringing non-human things into political culture, and mostly through what we would call rights. So do fish have rights? Do fish grant people rights? Do trees have rights? Do people have rights to trees? Which people have rights to the trees? Who gets to decide those questions? Um, so thinking of those kind of legal orders as a way in which human beings and other kinds of beings enter a political conversation together. And because it's a shared ecological space, which apparently is just the thing I come back to all the time, that has kind of multiple different political cultures represented from the the long and continuing indigenous traditions to the British and Russian empires, to the US and Canadian nation states, who answer these questions very differently from each other through time, um, and kind of leave legacies, or in the case of indigenous nations and contemporary nation states are still really working out who has sovereignty, who gets to <laughs> answer the question of where do the rights come from. So that's from 30,000 feet where that project is, at the level of the ground, there are many, many questions because I simply haven't done most of the work. But I'm hoping to be headed north next month, viral variants willing to actually start answering some of those questions. Toward the end of the interview, I also asked Dr. DeMuth if there was anything else about writing that she wanted to say. And I love what she added. I think one thing that that maybe didn't come up, and it's related a little bit to teaching writing, is that I think in sort of discussions of academic versus non-academic writing, there sometimes is kind of a, a split made between narrative writing and writing that has an argument to it. And I think that as historians, splitting those two things and separating them really kind of walls us off from the tools that are in narrative itself, which is that the narrative itself is an argument, right? How you tell a story is part of why the story matters, who comes first, who gets to speak, how much kind of page time different issues get, how things are described, what gets described, what the, the kind of emotional or affective experience of reading is. Those are not separate from argumentation, I don't think, um, or they don't have to be. And I understand why not all pieces are driven in that direction. There's a, you know, there's a clarity to sort of removing that narrative structure and sort of just saying what you're going to argue that's really appropriate for some kinds of genres. But I also think that, you know, if you're working in archives and sort of have the responsibility toward people's stories and the trajectories of communities through time, that not necessarily thinking that the parts of writing that deal in emotions and scene making and specifics of place are somehow separate from what it is that you're arguing. I think the two things can really be kind of melded together and that what some of the most durable and interesting narrative nonfiction does is, is that work. That was very well said. Thank you so much. As always, I could talk about writing all day, and I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, I really, I so appreciate this podcast. I wish it had existed when I was in grad school and was like, you know, I felt like there were all these things we talked about all the time and like how to sit down and write was not one of them, even though we all had to be doing it. <laughs> I too am grateful to these conversations and I am grateful to Bathsheba DeMuth for joining me today for this one. I hope you've enjoyed it. As always, you can find show notes and a transcript on draftingthepast.com. You'll also find links to the articles and books that we've talked about in this conversation there. Please share the podcast with someone else you know who would like it. And in the meantime, happy writing. 